Chief Justice, welcome to 730 South Australia. Thank you, Simon, and thank you for inviting me. Is the internet undermining the integrity of suppression orders? I think there's a danger it will. Uh, so far, the enforcement of, of um, suppression orders has rested on the fact that the traditional media, first of all, behave pretty responsibly, but secondly, they know if they breach the rules, they can be punished. Yet we see other people who breach the rules not being punished. Yes. It sounds like a question of self-interest. Yeah, and uh, the, the traditional media jump through hoops, but others don't. Yes. And the thing is, the other people, the people who are using the, the various electronic media, there are just so many of them and they're spread so far and wide that it would not be practical to prosecute all of them. And I guess the difficulty for the prosecuting authorities is which ones do you pick out to prosecute? And I suppose inevitably they'll then say, well, I'm the sacrificial lamb. So there is a problem, there's no doubt about that. Does someone need to be a sacrificial lamb, if I can put it that way? Do, does there, in your view, need to be a prosecution to send a message to people using the internet that this is serious and it is taken seriously? Well, it is serious. We can argue a lot about the policy of the law and whether courts always get it right. But I think everyone will agree there'll be some cases where the victim, alleged victim, does need to be protected. There'll be some cases where the prosecution want their investigation protected. There'll be some cases where a witness needs to be protected. So the difficulty is, are we going to abandon all forms of protection because we can't prosecute? So there is a serious issue there. But presumably we can prosecute, and there'd be examples on the internet where people are quite identifiable. Should they, in your view, be prosecuted? Well... I think it's really it's a very difficult question because I'm not sure what effect it would have if just a few were prosecuted. It may well be that the people who are doing it would just get a bit smarter, they would conceal their identities, and still there would be so many of them uh, on such a wide basis that you couldn't enforce the law. So it, you know, whether you can effectively stop it through prosecution is more a matter for the DPP and the police, but I can understand them possibly thinking that, uh, uh, you know, that, that it can't be stopped. Can you think of a way to stop suppression orders be broken, being broken on the internet? No, I can't. I, I think uh, it's impossible. Uh, one might say, well, why don't we make the penalty 20 years imprisonment? Why don't we prosecute a few people? And when people see it's really serious, they'll stop. The answer is I don't think society would, uh, would accept, and I don't think Parliament would accept that kind of punishment. Uh, and I think whatever you do, there'll be people in places you can't reach. There'll be in other countries... Uh, by the time you reach them, with some of them even in South Australia, the damage is done anyhow, and unless the way you treat them scares everyone else off, what you achieve, you stop that person, but there's a you know, hundred others who step into the breach. Has there ever been a prosecution, to your knowledge? Not so far as I'm aware. I, I couldn't be absolutely certain, but I don't remember any in the last few years, So, and I think I would, have, I think I would remember if there had been. So, But I think that partly reflects the fact that the traditional media, as I said, have been very responsible and what we're looking at now is a problem that has really crept up on us in the last probably two to three years. Can you explain why suppression orders are uh, important? And I'm asking the question, I guess, from an assumption that, that many would look at them and see them as simply protecting uh, the accused, people who don't deserve to be protected, the province of the rich and powerful, yes. so on and so forth. Well, certainly people tend to see them as protecting the accused, but quite often they'll be there, first of all, to protect an alleged victim, particularly with sexual offences, the victim, you could understand, would not want to give intimate detail about the offence and then you know, have their identity broadcast. Sometimes it'll be to protect a child or a vulnerable witness. Uh, some, as I said, sometimes it's there, or sometimes it's the prosecution who ask for suppression order to protect the integrity of their investigation. So I don't know numerically how many suppression orders are made to protect the identity of the accused person, but I would think probably they wouldn't be the majority even. They might be a substantial minority, but not the majority. That would be my expectation. So there are other interests being protected. The point you're just making brings us to Section 71A, the suppression, automatic suppression, that's made in cases of the identity of an accused in a sex case of obvious importance in South Australia um, at the moment. Uh, is that still necessary, that law, in your view? It's a good question. You called it automatic suppression. It's not really... That suggests it's a suppression order. It's not by a court. It's by the law directly, so it's a decision by Parliament. Uh, behind that decision is a long-standing debate as to whether people who've been charged with offences in any case should be identified at least until with serious offences it's found there's a case to answer and they're sent to trial. So one argument was that no such person should be identified. I think in the end... 
par Parliament settled for the policy view that that was too broad, but with sexual offences, because they attract so much public hatred and, uh, you know, and resentment, that it was reasonable to protect a person charged with a sexual offence from having his or her name revealed until they either plead guilty or are sent to trial. So the review that's going on, should it cover more than just 71A? This was the well, review that the Premier announced. Yes, I think day. it needs to because I don't think you can see 71A in isolation. 71A is the decision by Parliament, no names published. 69A is the one that gives the court power to make orders. I think you have to look at them together. But the other thing I think they need to do is, is look at what's happening in, say, America, Canada and England because it may well be that we've got to the point where we can't enforce the system anymore and it would be interesting to know what is happening in similar societies. And so if, say, in America you find, let's just assume, I don't know, you find they have virtually no suppression orders at all, but the system still copes, you might say, well, we might as well go the American way. Would you feel comfortable with that, with no suppression orders whatsoever? I don't, I don't personally have a very strong view about it, but, I'd, but I don't know how it's working in other countries. What I do accept is there'll be some situations in which, if you cannot have a suppression order, a prosecution will fail, either because a crucial witness won't give evidence, because the victim won't be willing to give evidence, or because the publicity about the case will be so intense and unfair that the accused can't get a fair trial. Well, so I, I we must add, there is a price. In other words, if we have no protection by suppression orders, we may find there'll be cases where the prosecution, for one reason or another, can't proceed, and that's not good either. Well, are we close to that point anyway, in your view, with what's happening on the internet? Not yet, uh, but I think things are moving pretty fast, and we could get to the point where people could reasonably say, what is the point of a suppression order if, uh, all over the internet, the person is being named and vilified? Um, so it, we are, it is, things are moving pretty quickly. The courts in this state have a reputation, deserved or not, of overusing suppression orders. Are you yes. comfortable with the amount of suppressions that come out in this state? In broad terms, uh, when a court makes a suppression order, the judge or magistrate has to look at the legal, you know, the legal principles and then look at the facts. There are cases where I read about them and I think, well, I don't think I would have made a suppression order there. But I also know how difficult it is when the application is made to you. I strongly believe in the importance of public reporting of what goes on in court, and so I'm reluctant to make suppression orders. But there are cases where you, you realise you just have to do it. And often the reality is in court, the judge or magistrate has to do it on the run. It's not as if they have hours to think about it. Something crops up in the case... There's an application then and there for a suppression order and to avoid delaying the case you have to decide it then and there. So you do have to do it on the run. But So in the broad I think the courts get it right but you know, we, all the judges and magistrates, they make mis we all make mistakes. So obviously there'll be cases where we make suppression orders, when I say we I mean collectively, where you shouldn't and there are probably some cases where we should have made suppression orders and we didn't. So mistakes will be made but by and large I think the courts get it about right. Back to this notion uh, of this special um, category for sexual crimes, yes. that uh, they are considered so heinous by the community that we need this particular order. But we've been talking about 71A. Uh, do you agree with that? I suppose I'm probably a bit in the middle on that. First of all, 71A also protects victims. We shouldn't overlook that. There's a separate provision which prohibits the disclosure of the name of an alleged victim unless the victim consents or the judge so orders. So we need to remember there are two parts. As to the protection of the offender, um, I think probably sexual offences do attract